Okay, we have an official quorum. Good evening, everyone, and Happy New Year. Uh, it's good to see everyone here. Um, and also good to see everyone in this new meeting space. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping notes um, in terms of the space. Uh, the team at DYCD were working on some logistics, so we're just testing out some layouts of the room just to try to make it conducive for the meeting and for all of you. So uh, we welcome any feedback and just bear with us as we kind of test out this format uh, so that it's acceptable to everyone. Also, um, a couple of changes in terms of the mic. So in terms of the videotaping of the meetings, we noticed that when there's feedback from members of the board, um, we couldn't hear them because of the mic placement. So there is some uh, mics placed on the ceiling here. Um, and for those of you that are going to respond, you'll probably notice that there will be a mic passed around just so we can hear you clearly, but also so that it's properly recorded on the videotape when it's uploaded to the site. Uh, our camera will be panning just so that we can at least get the feedback from those of you who are speaking. So again, uh, just work with us in terms of getting adjusted uh, to this space. Um, it's a nice space. It's obviously different than what we're uh, used to, so I look forward to having the meetings here. Um, with, that, with that said, it's good to see everyone here. We have a quorum, so we're going to move forward with the meeting as laid out. First item on the agenda is the accepting of the minutes. Uh, so that was emailed out to everyone. So if there aren't any questions or concerns in terms of the minutes of our last meeting, I will entertain a motion to accept the minutes. Again, a reminder, uh, if you make a motion, just please state your name uh, and speak to the mic so we can have it recorded for the video and for the stenographer. Uh, Thomas Dowd, move to accept the minutes. Move. We properly moved by Thomas Dow and seconded by Barrett Williams. All in favor, say aye. 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 Abstentions, objections, there being none, so moved. Uh, board correspondence, there currently isn't no board correspondence at the moment, so we'll move forward with that. Uh, financial and program quarterly report will be coming to us now. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Alan Chang, and uh, I was just recently appointed to be the uh, Chief Financial Officer at DYCD. came from the program side, and you might have seen me at previous meetings reporting mostly on summary of employment, but now I'm on the finance side. Uh, and it's good to see everybody. Um, about five, six pages in to the uh, handout, you will have uh, in front of you the uh, summary of our current uh, CSPG budget for FY15 and also what our expenses look like to date. So I want to direct your attention to that and I'm just going to highlight a couple of things and take any questions you might have. So if you're looking at that right now, um, you'll see that the total amount of funding for FY15 is $30.5 million, um, of which, and this is as of um, <clears throat> This, uh, this is as of, I think, a couple of days ago, year-to-date expenses. It's not today, but it was probably yesterday or the day before. Uh, we are currently at approximately 35% of, uh, uh, of the total uh, amount of the, the federal award in terms of expenditures, which takes us to 10 point, about 10, just a little bit under $10.7 million that has been expended so far. Uh, that is in the third column at the bottom, you'll see the total, and then there you'll see the breakdowns by individual program areas, as well as our um, <clears throat> other contractual services, which are basically administrative costs, uh, including like audits and, and reviews and uh, other events. Um, you also notice that uh, the expenses are different, and I'm sure it's been covered in previous meetings than what we've actually paid out. What we've actually paid out to the contracts is uh, just under $14 million, 13.9 about. Uh, and that reflects any advances that we have made to contracts. We typically give about 
one to two months of the advances to different programs so that they have, uh, and this starts from the very beginning of the contract so that they have some startup money, and we continue to roll about one to two months uh, of the advances so that program areas are not uh, short on cash flow. And that, that explains, and by the end of the fiscal year, we will recapture all 100% of the, uh, the, what's been paid out. On the next page, you will see where we are, where we look compared to the last time this report was uh, given to everybody. So you will see the last time the meeting was uh, in the, the end of November, we were roughly 19% uh, expended uh, in terms of the total grant, and we are now at 35%, as I mentioned earlier. And same thing with the payments, we were 20% um, expended last time we met in November, and we're now at 45%. And uh, one thing I want to highlight, just so you can see, a lot of, uh, I think this is, uh, this was shared at the last meeting, the legal services for um, immigrants, uh, for the immigration programs, was transferred over, and that was roughly $1.6 million, that was transferred over from DYCD to the Human Resources uh, Administration. Uh, that uh, transfer took effect at the end of uh, no, uh, October. Uh, we are, you won't see any expenses here yet because this is the first quarter that they're going to be reporting any expenditures to us. Uh, so that is missing, that information is missing, but we are working closely with um, HRA uh, fiscal shop to make sure we get that in and it will be reflected in the next report. Any questions? Any questions at all on the financial report? Before we move to accept, I should have did my due diligence. Want to congratulate you and your new role. A lot of us that have been working on the CAB, certainly those at the DYCD, known you for a long time. We wish you all the best in your new position. Know you do well. Thanks, Rick. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. If there are no questions, I entertain a motion to accept the financial quarterly report. So Thank moved you. by Margot Tunstall. I'm sorry, how do you pronounce your last name, Margot? Margot Tunstall. Tunstall. Second by Gloria Benfield. All in favor say aye. Aye. Abstentions, objections, there have been none. So moved. Next up is our commissioner's report. Hello everyone. Hi. <laughs> okay. So the first piece of the report really has to do with an RFP, the RFP update. I'm happy to report that we're making good progress with the process of involving NABs and, and CABs in this very important effort of including the community's voice and, and input in getting anti-poverty funds into our community. We know how important that is. The first order of business is, though, to, is to thank you. We know this was a rigorous process. We want to thank uh, the members who helped in this labor-intensive process, which included reading the proposals and participating in the evaluation meetings, which, la which ended last week. We are, we're aware that you might have experienced some kinks in the process, but we're learning from our experience and we will continue to find ways to make the process easier for everyone. I want to let you know that we really appreciate your pushing through the process as we experience some of those snags. Some people really stayed in there with us even if they experienced um, some problems. We can never say thank you enough because this couldn't have happened without you. Um, let me share some of the numbers. We received 600 proposals in total, 190 service competitions across 42 boards. We didn't receive proposals for around nine service areas, but that's, that won't affect the overall funding in each NDA and we're exploring ways to ensure that the funding is fully distributed across, according to the wishes of the NABs. 
when we finish the overall review, we will be able to give you a final report on those actual numbers. So again, thank you for all your work and all the ways that you made this happen. Um, the, you might have received um, a flyer out there this evening, and that flyer was really to invite you to this annual trip to Albany uh, that will happen on April 1st and 2nd. Um, and it is the, the New York State Poverty Symposium. So this has always been a very valuable event, um, mostly because uh, of your participation and involvement in the event. We're planning on sending another bus this year, so we'll notify you when we have all the final details so that you can participate this year. And lastly, uh, the HRA uh, update. Um, New York State Department of State has indicated that as part of their uh, next regular quarterly review, they will include a visit to HRA to meet the team um, who is overseeing the immigrant legal services service contracts with local providers. I think you heard uh, the woman that came from HRA representative last time and you had a lot of questions for her. HRA has recently re released their immigrant legal service concept paper and the RFP is scheduled to come out very soon. The YCD has provided input in this RFP and will be keeping close eye on that process, and that concludes this commissioner's report. Thank you for that report. Are there any questions regarding the commissioner's report? Okay, we thank you for that report. Now, I'll entertain a motion to accept the commissioner's report. Second, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, abstentions, there be a none, so moved. Very easy process. Move. Make a motion, second, we'll get the hang of it. I'm going to move around the agenda just a bit for our guest presentation and then we'll do the committee reports. So I want to welcome uh, today Joel, is it called Joel or is it Joel? Joel. Joel Alvarez, who's here from the Department of City Planning. Well, the senior geographic analyst um, here to discuss NTAs, which is the neighborhood tabulation areas, not to be confused with NBAs or NADs. Uh, but we welcome you here today uh, to speak to the CAB. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Uh, so I'm here from the Department of City Planning. Uh, Specifically with the Population Division, uh, we act as demographic consultants uh, for the whole city. So when the mayor or, or anyone else wants to know about uh, the specifics of, uh, uh, of a neighborhood or the city itself, uh, we, we give them that information. Uh, and we also work with um, the Census Bureau every 10 years in developing uh, the, the city's geographic units. So um, recently we've developed a new geographic unit of analysis, the neighborhood tabulation area. And uh, Bob Frenzelbera asked me to come here today to speak about this, um, this new geography because you've adopted this um, in, in, in your analysis for identifying service areas or, or the neighborhood development areas. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the development of this geography, neighborhood tabulation areas or NTAs, uh, and then about the value of why is it useful. So uh, let me start with the, the, a little bit of background. So neighborhood tabulation areas were created back in 2007, uh, Deputy Mayor Doktorov requested that we develop NTAs for the purposes of projecting populations for uh, Plan YC so that we could 
project at a neighborhood level what was going on through the year 2030. Um, but uh, we had to settle on a geography that wasn't too big, wasn't too small. Wasn't too big because we needed that specificity. It was valuable to know what was going on at a small scale. But it couldn't be too small because the projections process would fall apart. The data wouldn't be reliable. Uh, our projections wouldn't be reliable if we, if we de dealt with too small of an area. So we settled on uh, this geography that was somewhere between community districts or as the Census Bureau refers to them as PUMAs, so CDs or PUMAs, uh, and, and it was somewhere between that and census tracts. Uh, so census tracts being, a lot of people have heard the terms, but uh, census tracts are areas that are about 10 blocks or so, or about uh, three to 4,000 people. And importantly, they uh, are, are neighborhood tabulation areas approximated neighborhoods. So uh, we, we looked at a number of different sources. We had historical sources. Uh, we had uh, the Encyclopedia of New York City from Ken Jackson uh, and a number of other publications from Professor Jackson. Uh, we had uh, our, our borough planners who are in close communication with the different communities, all giving us feedback into how should we create these neighborhood tabulation areas. But they had to fit into these bounds. They had to be, they had to use census tracts as building blocks. And they had to be fit within our community districts or our, our Pumas. So why are these neighborhood tabulation areas valuable? They are significantly smaller than CDs or Pumas, and, and, and so that was, that's useful in, in having this geographic uh, specificity. In general, neighborhood tabulation areas are uh, average about a population of 35,000 people, anywhere from as small as 15,000 people up to just a little over 100,000. This opposed to community districts uh, or, or Pumas, as the Census Bureau refers to them, uh, they, are, they are, have a minimal population of 100,000 for Pumas, and they can get as big as 250,000. So uh, we've, we've dramatically cut down on the size, and so that's valuable because we get that geographic specificity. And then on top of that, like I said before, they approximate neighborhoods. When, when New Yorkers think about areas beneath the borough level, sub-borough geographies. They don't talk about census, I live in census tract 102 in Queens. They talk about, I, I live in, I live in Chinatown, I live in Mott Haven. They talk about neighborhoods. So these are the areas that New Yorkers are familiar with. So it was, it was useful for us to, to adopt these geographies because it's, it's something that's very organic, something very familiar to New Yorkers. And, uh, Thirdly, uh, uh, this is very important, uh, the data are very reliable at this level. So we draw, for our economic analyses, we draw all of our information, almost all of our information at a sub-borough level from uh, primarily one source, the Census Bureau's American Community Survey. And the data that are published at a census tract level are not reliable. Uh, when released from the, this American Community Survey. It's a survey and it's just, if you have a robust sample size, it's reliable. But at a census tract level, we don't have a robust sample size. So we move up to this neighborhood tabulation area, which is a little bit bigger, about 10 times bigger on average than a typical census tract. And then we have a decent sample size, a robust sample size. So let me put this in real terms. For example, if you had a, a a census tract uh, with a median household income of $60,000. $60, if you got this from the American Community Survey, on average that would be plus or minus $20,000. It's not very accurate. So it could be anywhere between $80,000 and $40,000. It's not the kind of accuracy 
that we need for doing any kind of economic analysis. It's just inappropriate for it. But if we move to an NTA level, that, that precision is, is improved, and we get much more reliable uh, estimate. So it could be anywhere between that, that estimate of 60,000 could be anywhere between 67,000 and 53,000. So it's, it's, it's a great improvement. It's still not uh, perfect, but it's much better. And it's appropriate for the analysis that you're carrying out. So moving quickly, I'm just going to give you an overview just to show you there's 188 neighborhood tabulations areas across the city. Like I said before, they're composed of census tracts. Here I've zoomed into the West Village. Sorry, it's difficult to see from, for you guys up front. But um, I've zoomed in here to the West Village. You can see the, the census tracts that compose uh, uh, an example of a, of a neighborhood tabulation area. You see this one is named the West Village. It's a very familiar name for people. So it's not odd. Um, and, and so that's the the geography. You can see that, that tracks are the building blocks. Now here, you see that second constraint. We, we needed to start with tracks as the building blocks, but they also needed to fit perfectly within Puma boundaries. Puma boundaries are more or less equivalent to, to community district boundaries. So here we have the example of, of, of uh, the, the Puma that encompasses Bushwick. We've divided Bushwick into Bushwick North and Bushwick South. So we get a little bit of geographic specificity. You can see the track building blocks and you can see that neighborhood tabulation areas never cross over these Puma boundaries. And then I'm, I'm going to leave you with this. This is, this is a very good example because uh, and I think it's uh, useful for uh, the work that you do. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of statistical mumbo jumbo here, but what, this, what these two maps tell you is it, it shows you the tracks with reliable estimates of poverty shaded in blue. In this first map, you see a map of tracked geographies. So you only see about 20% of all tracks in the city provide reliable estimates of poverty. So working at a track level, it's very difficult to do. If we move up to an NTA level, we increase our sample size, and we have much more reliable estimates. So approximately 95% of all of the neighborhood tabulation area estimates are reliable enough to be used for analysis. Uh, and that's, that's, that's really it. I can open it up for uh, questions. I just want to leave you with, uh, this is our, our website. If you want to check out our website, we've got a lot of data up there. And if you want a, a very detailed map of neighborhood tabulation areas, I know that all of you have different areas of interest, geographic areas of interest, uh, you can see where your neighborhood tabulation areas are, uh, including uh, all the different street names. So, are there any questions? That's just, you know what, this is just the, the, the Puma name. So every, every Puma or, or you know, more or less CD has a number associated with it, the same way that the census tract does. So the, the census defines it. The census just comes up with numbers. So, so next to here you'd see 4,003. You know, there's just across, across the city you have different numbers associated with different Pumas. And so the number is, isn't, doesn't mean anything like population. It's just, it's just for a name. Yeah. And so uh, the, another question is for um, for the population why? So uh, you said by the CV the uh, coefficient of the variance. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That one is a very interesting. What when the n become 188? Will that be the smaller sample number by statistically? 
Well, uh, um, it's just saying the total number, that, that n there, uh, isn't referring to the sample size. That n is referring to the total number of geographic units. So we have 180 uh, NTAs across the city. Uh, so that's what that n means. And then uh, here, I'm sorry, this was the n that he was referring to. And then over here, it just means that we have now, in, in, since the 2010 census, we have 2,168 census tracts. So that's what those N's stand for. It just, it just means that you know, we have small populations on average uh, in all of those census tracts, on average between three to 4,000 people in each of these census tracts. But in each of these NTAs, on average, we have about 3, 000, uh, 35,000 people. So how we can identify the, uh, the more poverty population by using this data, and how can we apply it for the funding? or the city planning-wide, or city-wide? So, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I wasn't prepared to speak about this process, but I do know that, that uh, we send information over to Bob, and the information is on, on poverty, and we get estimates of poverty from the Census Bureau. And actually, the Census Bureau, you were saying that it's, it comes out every 10 years. The American Community Survey, the data on poverty, that we that we use and you use for the analysis is is collected every year and actually released every year now. So uh, it's the American Community Survey. It's a sub it's, it's it's a subset of the Census Bureau. So the the census that everybody most people are familiar with is the decennial census. It's that short form that everybody received back in 2010. Every every household in the country received that. Now with the American Community Survey every year one out of a hundred households receive a very detailed survey. It'll ask you about the economic conditions in your household. It'll ask you about the housing conditions. It'll ask you about your education. It'll ask you about the language that you're spoken on. It's very detailed. And that's, it's a continuous survey. And every year, uh, one out of a hundred households across the United States receive this survey. And that's what we use to, to conduct this analysis of, of you know, determining the, the neighborhood development areas? Uh, because I participate in the census door by door, uh -huh. but I, I don't see the American uh, Community Survey in my neighborhood. I wish they did better outreach. I wish the Census Bureau had better outreach when it came to the American Community Survey because it's very important. And as you can see, uh, the work that we're doing here is, is relying on it. And so uh, the more people that know about it, the more people will understand that there are confidentiality agreements that you have with the Census Bureau that the Census Bureau is obliged to, to stand by, and, uh, and it'll encourage more people to participate. So it's important that everybody knows. So shall we, shall we move on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, we do. Yes, yes, we use Esri for, for, for some of this mapping. Yes. So, could you have broken it down by zip code? And also, sure, sure. I the, the, the housing department also collects census data. I know that's an area where you can also get a lot of data from for this type of analysis. You know, it, Oh, I guess the transcriber can't hear you. Oh, no, but okay, so, so, so he was saying that uh, isn't it possible that we could use zip code data, right? And, uh, housing, data. and, and housing data to inform this. Yeah, because they collect it every year, actually. Yes. Yeah. Well, so we, we can use, you know, actually, uh, it's, a, it's a great suggestion. And the geographic unit that comes closest to approximating neighborhood tabulation areas in New York City are zip codes. Actually, the Census Bureau doesn't release it exactly as zip codes. They, they release it as zip code tabulation areas, but it's more or less the same thing. Um, the difficulty with that is that it, it doesn't fit so perfectly in these puzzles of all this hierarchy of census geographies. Yeah, right. But once you have the database, you can, um, using the ESR software, you can also um, do a query on 
on a particular zip code. I know because I use the software. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it, it is helpful. Uh, um, you know, there are advantages to that approach. I would say because the, a lot of health data are collected uh, at a zip code level, so it's, it's, it's a great unit of analysis. I would still say weighing the pros and cons, I would go with neighborhood tabulation areas. We also have the neighborhood names and that this is based, that the neighborhood tabulation areas, even though they, they're not precisely neighborhoods, they, are, they do have neighborhoods in mind in their construction, whereas zip codes do not. And like I said, this is, this neighborhoods are, are a geography that's very familiar to most New Yorkers, as opposed to, you, you know what zip code you're in, but it's very difficult to know the boundaries of that zip code. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people don't know what um, census block you're in, what the zip code is more familiar. Is more familiar. But still less familiar, I'd say, than neighborhoods. Right, last question. What other um, analysis do you work with today? Because I know during the vote, people are doing a lot of analysis using the ESRI software. Mm -hmm. And as you know, this is how it started back in England when they had the outbreak. Mm -hmm. So what other um, type of uh, use are you putting this information to besides just studying uh, poverty? Uh, because the poverty comes, you know, a whole bunch of other issues. Well, actually, uh, recently we've come out with a whole book a uh, whole book of analysis on on um, the the foreign born living here in New York. Uh, so I think that that might that's probably interesting again to a lot of people in this room. Um, so we look at uh, their distribution, the foreign born broken down by country of birth and their distribution across uh, our city. Um, we talk about the changes that have occurred in, in their settlement patterns. Uh, we talk about their, their socioeconomic well-being. We talk about uh, where, they, where we think, what, what direction they're going in as, as well. And, and that whole book is available online uh, on, on our website. So if you go down our website, all of that analysis is available. And, and, uh, and we have many more reports, but that's Notably, what we've done recently. Last question. Okay. <laughs> Do you share this information with the police department for consent? Uh, we we have not shared. Uh, you know, we've had maybe one or two requests from the police department, um, and I'm not sure if they've used it for CompStat. I think that their analysts draw the information from the Census Bureau on their own. We have very limited contact with this police department. Oh, that, oh, that was <laughs> fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, this is the issue right now. In the I'll state. leave it to the chair. <laughs> the, 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 no, it's a major issue. Okay. Not, not only in New York, but across this country. Okay. Immigration is a major issue. And you know we have an immigration board. Mm -hmm. So how can this information be utilized to, to help some of the immigrants who really need help and also, you know, to be on the other side? To them out and send them right. Yeah. I mean, I think I think that for the most part, and, and this is this is a fear. I think that, that people are going to be using these these data for for negative purposes. And and actually, we have a very close relationship with the Office of Immigrant Affairs. Um, and I would I think that uh, the work that they do is 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 beneficial to to to, to our immigrant communities here in New York. Um, so, um, I think in general we make our data available to the public. That is, that is sort of our primary purpose. We put all this information up on our website and it's there for the public. And I think if the public has access to it and they're armed with it, I think it can do, you know, only support uh, democratic purposes. I mean, a lot of applications, it's a, very, it's a very robust data set, there's a very rich 
and uh, you know a lot of a lot of potential applications, and I think a lot of positive potential positive applications. Okay. Any other questions? We just want to move the meeting on. Anyone else had any questions from the staff? Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Appreciate it. The link to the website looked extensive there. Can we arrange to have that link sent out to the board? If you didn't get a chance to co copy that link, can, can you forward that? Yes, I'll leave you with a copy of the presentation yeah. and it, you can make it available. Yeah. Okay, okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so moving the meeting along, uh, we're going to go to the committee reports. I don't have any specific updates, uh, more more of an announcement. Uh, we all know Bernice Williams, who sits on the CAP, hasn't been to the meeting in some time. She was hospitalized uh, prior to the holidays, so I have good news to report that she is home. She's doing well, and she's expected to be at our next CA, CAP meeting, and uh, hopefully for the committees that she sits on, you'll be look forward to seeing her. So that deserves a round of applause. She was at hospitalized for about four months in South Carolina, so uh, we're happy to uh, to hear that. All right, first up is going to be Joseph Pierre with our governance committee meeting. I'm trying to talk away. I have my voice carries. I'm trying my best. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> I just want to say that uh, for the follow up. If you look at um, governance committee's minutes, you would notice that we dealt with excused absences. And we are still in the process of dealing with excused absences. It actually became um, noticeable because the state made some, some objections to and critiques to the bylaws. So we are now looking at how we deal with excuses especially when we have um, public servants and regular members of the community who attend these meetings. And we don't want to create a situation where it's, um, it's, it's an unusual type of conditions where one is penalized and the other is not. We want to create a level playing field so that when we deal with absences, it would be across the board, whether you are not your political servant or whether or not you just come from the regular community. So that's something that we are currently working on. We are still working on it. It's still in the discussion stages and it will continue at the next meeting when the governance committee meets. So those of you who have any interest in having your voice heard, is invited to be at governance. Uh, the follow-up, you would notice on the second paragraph, small paragraph, there was a question asked about the role of, of the CBA in, in the, uh, uh, the CAB and, 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 its, and its role within this whole process with the YCD. We fortunately got an answer, and that answer we got at the committee's level meeting, and we are now perusing that one-page document to see the substance that it brings and what our future comments to it would be. So this is something also that is in, 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 in transition as well. Uh, and that is where we are at current. So please look over the document for those who have it. And I would end with that for tonight. Thank you. Are there any questions for Joseph regarding his report on the Governance Committee? If not, I entertain a motion to accept the Governance Committee report. So moved. It has been properly. Most say your name, please. 
Gloria Benfield seconded. It's been seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Abstentions? Those opposed? There being none, so move. Next up will be Melissa with our program committee report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Melissa Hall, Executive Director of the Board of Trustees of the Board of Trustees of the Board of Trustees of the Board of the Board of Committee met on December the 3rd. We were presented by Harlem RBI, which was a great program up in Harlem that targeted youth um, to play sport, engage them in sports, and um, they provided GED, uh, ESL, they assisted them also with uh, after school homework, and they, and oh, and also um, young, young leadership in the community. So they, they have a variety of programs that they build up around the sports uh, program, uh, in addition to playing baseball and softball with the young women. Um, some of the suggestions that were made to them were uh, included specifically targeting the materials so that young women would be, because um, you know I'm a woman, right? So we wanted to make sure that young women were targeted and encouraged to, to participate in the program because the flyering was a little one-sided. But it did have a, a, a young woman's component in it, and so we wanted to encourage that as well. Um, overall, we thought it was a great program, and I certainly followed up with them afterward, and that was really it. Any questions? No? So disappointed. I hope to see you at the next meeting. Uh, for programs, that's where you actually get to meet some of the organizations that we fund and get to ask them questions and make suggestions as to how they're serving our youth with the funds that we allocate in our community. So if you're interested in what's going on and want to be able to respond to them directly, this is the, pro this is the committee that you want to participate in. Thank you. Oh, my bad. <laughs> I'll entertain a motion to accept to accept that committee report. As we move, state your name, please. Second It's been properly seconded. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed abstentions. There being none. And last up is going to be Sandy with our participation committee report. Um, so it'll be quick. We had a pretty quick meeting back in December and you can see the updates in the notes. So we got an update, which you heard again from um, in the commissioner's report about the status of the RFP reading. So we were happy to see that that was um, successful and a lot of people participated. So thank you for that. Um, and then the other big thing is that we are continuing conversations about inviting NAB members to these meetings and cultivating a better relationship with them. So those conversations are ongoing and we look forward to, to moving that forward. Um, and just as my other colleagues did, just a plug, if you want to get more involved um, with our work with the NEBs, then feel free to join the next participation committee meeting. Thank you, everyone. Are there any questions? Great. Thanks. Okay, short, sweet. So if there are no questions, I accept the uh, independent motion to accept the committee report. So moved. Bill Williams. Seconded by Jason Price. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, abstentions, there being none, so moved. And the last committee report would be the executive committee report. We did meet, as we always do, um, to review the agenda that's before you um, and to also go over any final uh, comments regarding the various committee reports you just heard from. Two items of notes that was discussed at the committee meeting. One, uh, which Melissa uh, suggested a couple of meetings ago, is that a letter uh, is going to be drafted to go out to the borough presidents to invite them to the last meeting, the last scheduled meeting of the year. I believe that's in June. Um, and the purpose of this is one, so they have the opportunity to, to greet the members. Um, 
and get updates on the various programs and talk about funding sources and so forth. So we thought that'd be a good idea. Uh, the letter's been drafted uh, and to fill the vacancies, absolutely. Uh, so we can look forward to seeing hopefully one or two uh, bow presents at that meeting. Um, Joe Cantrapone has assisted in, in drafting that letter and making sure that letter will go out. So um, we'll keep you updated on the progress of that as we get closer to um, the last scheduled meeting of uh, that particular fiscal year. The other thing that was discussed is uh, focused around what I opened with today, and that is um, the logistics of the room and the feedback that came from the videotaping and being able to hear uh, the members when uh, footage of this is uploaded to the website. Uh, for those who don't know, um, these are obviously public meetings and uh, transcripts of these meetings are uploaded to the website. Um, and if we can't hear any of the feedback from any of you and the executive committee, um, it really doesn't serve the purpose. So hopefully the placement of the mics and the logistics of the room and the videotaping and the panning uh, will help that go forward. So uh, we look forward to that improved uh, aspects. And we'll continue to work in the, on the logistics of this room. We know DYCD has worked tirelessly in like the last two months just dealing with the move here and everything else and, re and really trying to stay focused on, you know, continuing business at hand because the move doesn't stop the business. It still has to continue. Um, so we appreciate your patience in, in terms of that. Any questions or feedback regarding the Executive Committee report? If not, I entertain a motion to exact the... Has been moved, state your name, please. Esther Adams. Moved by Esther Adams. Seconded by Norm O'Brien. Properly seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Abstention. Opposed. There have been none. So moved. Any old business that needs to be discussed? Old business. Okay, good. Any new business? New business. Okay, great. So if there is no old business and new business, I will entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. It's been moved. Second. Been properly seconded by Gloria Penfield. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Great. Have a great evening. We look forward to you to uh, attend the next meeting. Uh, we hope to get the link to the presentation out to you and any feedback on the logistics of the room or anything else, feel free to contact uh, anyone in the executive committee or DYCD. Thank you and have a great evening. Hey Joe, how you doing?